Here we go again. This is a new session, a new uh, series of questions. And the first one is from Walter. He's asking, how do you clean a leather strop? Not complicated. And uh, it's not a dumb question either, because what happens when you apply the wax to the surface of your strop? Do I have any here? When you apply the wax to here, it keeps building up and building up, and then it gets compressed into the leather and it becomes very slick. So periodically, if I was going to sharpen this chisel, I would have gone here, but bump, bump, sharpened it, and then I would just go with the side corner of my chisel, and I would just pull it down like this, and it scrapes off the surface, but it leaves the leather there. It leaves the leather in place. So that works just fine, and it doesn't deteriorate the leather. So that's how I clear off my leather straps, and I've done it that way for years. I don't use the same chisel every time, and it does round the corners here over a long time, but it's so minimal, like 50 years, you might find you've rounded the chisel corner, but it's not an issue, no. And you could use just about any tool that has a sharp corner too, so that's that one. Um, this is a, a question, cutting dovetails or even tenons on the ends of long pieces, for example, like the ones you did in the trestle table, by standing on a stool of some kind, but what if the pieces are 20 feet long? I'm thinking timber framing, for example. Um, I think this one is an easy one uh, because just as you do in timber framing, you often sit and straddle the work and work from above or work from the side straddling. So in other words, you upend one end of the 20 foot length, set it on your trestle. The other end is lying on the floor and you do work awkwardly, but it, with big bulky timbers like that, it's not usually an issue. You can use a saw, you can use chisels, you can chop, pare, uh, all kinds of cuts you can do that way. Um, his, he has two questions. Uh, what are your thoughts and feelings about timber framing in general? How would you compare it to furniture making? Uh, to the furniture making you do, are the tools and workshop required requirements different? Is timber framing something that needs a team of a minimum number of woodworkers to work out? Okay, this is quite diverse really. I've worked in a timber framing workshop where I was the furniture maker and right next door to me were 10 Polish timber framers and they worked right alongside me and we would often compare what they did with what I did. Yes, they used um, chisels and split cuts the same way I would on my furniture. So if they're cutting a tenon, they would split cut, but everything was massive. Everything was much bigger for them. I even saw them using um, steel wedges instead of chisels to split because that would split much faster. So with things like that, they would use a bigger plane to pair across the ends of the tenons to make the tenons fit. So it was very different, but very much the same. And so it's just a more refined way of working. I am surprised with timber framing how accurately they work, even though there's such a massive um, timbers that they're working with, they do seem to work to quite fine tolerances and it's because the shoulder lines have to be crisp and clean. They're not relying on the peg so much to hold the joint together as the, uh, the compression of the fibers when they drive the draw bore to pull the shoulder to the side of the beam or whatever, that's what they rely on. And, and this business about the team, I've worked with both people, I've seen people um, erect a whole timber frame building 30 feet by 20 feet on their own by just using um, additional equipment like a forklift or a backhoe and things like that. I've seen people build a whole structure on their own doing that. But then again, there's the camaraderie of working together. You know, you get five or six people, men, women. They just want to do a timber frame pole barn or something like that. And they just love working together. And I think that's important too. So that becomes more interactive with other people. The other one is interactive with just machines. One makes you completely independent. The other makes you completely interdependent. And I like the interdependency. It's very nice. So I hope that answers your question. And I can't say what your name is because it doesn't seem to be a name. Okay, Michael, um, he says, I have need of a good quality set of drill bits, countersink bits for my drill driver. So he's talking a little bit differently. He's talking about something like this, the ubiquitous drill driver. You power powering that bit into the wood. And, um, but that doesn't mean that your work is sloppy and we have different bits <coughs> that work differently. 
For instance, if you have a bit like this one, this is just a regular twist drill. This has a bevel on this side, a bevel on this side, a flute down here and a flute down here. So usually they'll have two flutes in there, sometimes more, depending on the type. You load this in the drill bit and you drill your hole. And usually the rim of the hole isn't quite as pristine as you might get from something like this where we have completely different uh, um, dynamic here at the cutting edge. These two outer wings protrude past and they create, they cut the rim of the hole as you drill and then there's a brad point bit here and that drills a very different hole. So this one gives a clean entry, a very clean, I'm going to just hold that for you to see the contrast between the two. Now this isn't really the best quality bit and you can get superb quality ones. Veritas makes a set, a small set and a large set. They're quite expensive but they are worth having and they are called lip, uh, I think they're called lipped bits, lip spur bits. You see, very okay, high speed lipped brad point bits they term them as, so that's the bit you might use. There's also what they call a rim bit or a forstner bit and that cuts a circle very cleanly and the rim of the bit is what actually keeps control as it goes into the wood. And then of course you have other bits, auger bits, but he's asking for bits you can load into this thing here. So that's a very different um, part, uh, aspect of uh, drilling. So it's very boring this subject, you know. But anyway, then he asks about what would we use for countersinking. And let me see if I have a, I probably don't, but I used to have the typical rose pattern um, countersink bit, but they, they vibrate. When you drill a hole like this, they vibrate. Let me show you what I mean with these bits here, actually designed for engineering. These were, I've got different sizes here. So you can buy different sizes and you can usually buy a set. And actually they're very inexpensive. They can be had for anywhere from five pounds and up for a set of four. Um, I use this one. This is the first one I ever had and I've had this for two decades and I'm still using the same bit. It's never been sharpened and I had to put this extension on here because I liked it to protrude a little bit more. So when you trim the, rill of a, the rim of a hole here with this, it cuts a beautiful hole and what's really happening, I'm going to do a bigger one here. This is a brand new one, so I'm going to drop this in here, the ugly hole on the rim there, but get that spinning and get the speed up before you press. And you get a very clean hole, it's vibration free, and you can put this in reverse, like that, and you can polish the rim, you can polish the edge of the hole and consolidate it so that when you set the screw in there, it seats on the, on the aspect of the rim there, on the countersunk edge. So that's what I would use. Those are the ones I use. I still rely on my auger and bits for general boring because I just feel like I have total control and I really like that. So that, those are my choices for bits, especially for the countersink bit. You do get what you pay for very often. All right. This is from, from Amandeo. Amandeo. Where did you buy or get your clamps from? I live in Portugal and wonder whether I can buy them in eBay, Amazon or any other site. You can get them from eBay and Amazon and certainly if you go to um, the UK site is probably where you'll find them. They are sold also by a company called Screwfix here in the UK and I don't know if they sell to uh, Portugal or send to Portugal. But then there's a company in Germany called Dieter Schmidt Fine Tools and they will supply the whole of Europe and they are really very top-notch um, clamps. This is the type of clamp he's talking about here. It's an aluminium bar square section or rectangular section threaded here and this moves along here. And these are excellent clamps. They're very nice. I like them. I use them all the time. So that's how, those are the types of clamps he's talking about. Basically it's a sash clamp, it's what we would have called a sash clamp because it was used to make sashes, it was a lightweight clamp 
and we use them in furniture making, very nice for furniture making. Okay, uh, that's that, now then. Okay, so, oh, somebody's clamping, laminating their bench top or laminating uh, US 2x4s together. We have them here, this type of 2x4 here, but we have very square section 2x4. So when I'm laminating up a 2x4, I don't have the, the rounded edges. He's referring to them as chamfered edges, but they're not chamfered. They're actually a definite uh, one eighth or quarter inch, not a quarter inch, a one eighth radius here. So when you put them together, you end up with these grooves in here, and that's what he's referring to. And he's asking whether he should plane off those rounded edges first and then do the lamination for his bench top. And I say no, I say go ahead and glue them up, get them as level as you possibly can, and then when you've got this big mass of wood, you can just clamp it to the bench top, and the mass itself gives you something to really work against. And you can take out those, it's really only about maybe a 32nd of an inch that you have to take it down, and you have to take that down anyway to get the level you want for your bench top. So that's what I would do. Uh, all right. You say, should I, okay. Um, glue the surfaces, give it off. Okay, cam clamps. This is the next one. This is these that we, we made these on via woodworking master classes and YouTube. And um, these are the ones that uh, are used quite often in instrument making, but these are in box making, lightweight work, and stuff like that. And what this person is saying is that when he clamps his up like this, so he squeeze here and then he clamps here. His are slipping, mine are gripping just fine, but his are slipping. And what he's asking is what do you do? So the answer is if you've got chalk, just powder some chalk right in here and make a few passes like this and the chalk will increase the friction level. Better than that is if you can get, just go along to any violin shop and buy some rosin, it's very cheap and just sprinkle the powder. You can either powder it up on a grater or you can buy it ready powdered and just drop it straight into that opening and that will increase that and stop it from slipping. So same stuff for violin making as it is for us making our clamps. So that works perfectly. So that's uh, clamp slippage. And here's a big question. This is a very uh, difficult question in some ways but an easy question in others. Somebody this is coming from Trafton and he's asking me, big fan of your work and getting people to pick up the hand tools again. I started following you last year or so and jumped right in. I've recently moved to California and I'm having trouble finding an employer willing to give me a chance to train. I wanted to see if, I, if you had any suggestions on how to find someone that could help or how, snag, or how to snag an apprenticeship. This finds you well, and I wish you the best. Trafton. All right, um, this is a common question. People cannot get apprentices, uh, or cannot get apprenticeships. And, and there's a complaint sometimes that we can't get apprentices. That's not the common complaint now. The common complaint is I can't find somewhere to train. And so here, what I've written, I'm going to read it to you first of all. Um, you didn't give any age, you didn't give any experience details, uh, no dependence details or former training. Are you supported or supporting parents, uh, home, partner, support? These things all make a difference. So if you've got support from somebody else, can you work for free? Can you volunteer yourself into work for a three month period so that anybody that could possibly be a would be um, trainer, apprentice, would have some feeling like this guy is really top notch. I would love to have him. If I lose him now, um, my business would go down. Uh, something like that, where he has some time, uh, some idea of who you are. Who is this man that want or woman that wants to work here? And um, I've been writing a blog on this issue for a long time. Different issues about apprenticing, and you have to look at the definition of apprenticeship these days because. Everybody uses the term for general training for just about every task that anybody has. So if you're filling shelves in a supermarket, you will find yourself apprenticing as a shelf filler. That's very different than craft training 
where repetitive over and over uh, tasks are repeated until you become so expert at it you don't even think about it it's just like writing your name when you cut a dovetail it's just like signing something and and that's what it should become that's what craft work becomes um, of course it's uh, it's been passed on as well that's another thing that the craft training as an apprenticeship has been passed on to colleges and universities now that's not always the best place to gain the kind of work and experience that you want and often the colleges and universities will say okay we're giving you the basic three R's we're getting you through this but now you need experience of working with a craftsman or a craftswoman that can give you what you really need and actually it should possibly be the other way around the craft experience on the job with people will get you into the craft without going on to college or university but if you choose to go to college or university for whatever reason then that's an additional uh, skill set that you would get they would have something to offer you that would take you beyond what you might get in the field but definitely training in the field as an apprentice is the best way many times people say you know that they feel when they go into their apprenticeship that they're going to somehow be profitable for their employer or that their employer is making profit on them in most cases they're not an apprentice actually robs an employer of his time because he then becomes I know I've worked out that when I have an apprentice working with me he actually diminishes my capacity by at least 50 percent if I have two apprentices working with me my my work ability is almost diminished to zero so then I have to work through those people if I had 10 apprentices then I could do all of my work through them in times past when somebody was an apprentice they worked for a man a master and he might have six or ten other workers and that apprentice would be a distributed amongst those people and they would be that means that the cost of him being there the demand of it him being there is is uh, feathered out amongst other people not just one person and then the other thing is you have to remember that people are having a different attitude towards their apprenticeship because they go in saying I want to train as a furniture maker because I want to be a furniture designer maker on my own account if you come to me and say well I want to do that I might say well hang on a minute where are you going to start your business well I'm going to start my business right next door to you so if I take on 10 apprentices over 10 years I can end up with 10 competitors right next door to me so there's a false expectation there that somebody uh, should be able to demand an apprenticeship that's not the case I think it would depend you need long-term experience you need to work with somebody but then there was a sense when I was an apprentice that I just served my apprenticeship I served the man that I worked for for six years that was very important in my training it was very important to him because he invested probably two years when I was really very inefficient and other people were inefficient so there's a payback that comes from having a longer apprenticeship and that's why they did have longer apprenticeships was because that was the payback to the master uh, for the period of time of training so don't go in with false expectations be realistic about it what will your employer your trainer gain from you working for him is he, is he just going to train you and at the end of the year you're thumbing your nose up and you're off doing your own business I don't think that's a good equation for the for the man and I, I know you have to look at the whole of it not just you're going through the training and coming out the other side to set up in competition there i know it's a hard life it's hard to get into but i'm sure you can make it by doing the volunteer issue and then seeing what transpires from that